Welcome to day two of Tableau Conference 2019. Today, I want to show you how to build data science workflows using Tableau Prep and turn model insights into action. Oh. My name is Alyssa Peck, and I'm kind of a nerd. I got my master's degree in statistics, something only math nerds do. I then went to work for a few different companies as a data scientist before landing at Tableau, home to many data nerds. Most of my two years here have been spent helping the marketing and sales team more effectively allocate their employee time and investment. My nerdiness also extends into my personal life. I am a huge National Parks geek. I even keep a Tableau viz showing how many parks I visited. In case you're wondering, I've been to 22 out of the 61 US national parks. I'm also a hobbyist of many things, including biking, gardening, baking, sewing, reading, and anything else I can try to learn. And finally, my favorite fact to throw out at any introduction is that I'm an identical triplet. Here's a picture of me and my sisters who arrived a little too early for a Tom Petty concert last year. And on that bombshell, I'm here to talk to you about how to use Tableau's suite of products to bring the wonderful insights of your data science models to end users. But first, I need to tell you something. Statistics show that your data science model won't make it into production. What statistics, you ask? VentureBeat AI said that 87% of data science projects never make it into production. Ouch. Similarly, a new Vantage report said that 77% of businesses agree that adoption of big data and AI initiatives represent challenges for their organizations. And shockingly, Gartner made this quote, that 80% of AI projects will remain alchemy, run by wizards whose talents will not scale in the organization. So you might be thinking, how is this possible? If so many data science projects fail, then why are companies still hiring these roles at such a rapid rate? What's going on here? Well, let me give you some thoughts. And first of all, this is a subjective list and certainly not exhaustive. There can be many reasons why a data science project might fail, but let's start with these. Sometimes they should fail. This might sound a bit harsh, but let me give you an example. Say my boss comes to me raving about this amazing model she heard about, where a pet store chain was scraping Instagram photos to determine who was a cat or a dog owner. Using that information, they can target content specific to these users. So a cat owner might get ads for litter boxes and cat food, and a dog owner might get ads for dog treats and dog bones. My manager thinks it'd be really cool if I could build this exact same model for Tableau. The problem is, we at Tableau don't need that information. This isn't going to change how we help our customers and help them understand data. Certainly, my time is better spent on many other models before working on this one. Data issues. We're all too familiar with these and probably keep at least half of this room up at night. Usually, they're relatively minor and might result in a moderate reduction in the accuracy of our models. Sometimes though, they can be so severe as to prevent us from building a model at all. Say we want to build an abandoned cart model where we want to predict which users on our buy.tableau.com website might abandon their cart. Of course, we need some information on who has things in their cart and did not purchase versus those who had things in their cart and completed a purchase. Well, if this web page isn't tagged, we can't build that model because we won't have any data about these users flowing in. Other times, leadership itself might prevent work on a particular project, and oftentimes, I find that this is due to a lack of understanding. I've experienced leadership getting pretty hung up on the fact that models aren't perfect. As data scientists, 
we can quantify the imperfection of our models and say things like, this model is 80% accurate at predicting X. However, simply exposing and allowing leadership to see that there is inaccuracy or error in our models might make them want to stick with the status quo, which we know that sometimes is literal guessing. Other times though, a data scientist is working on a great idea, has all of the data that they need, and leadership is bought in and fully on board, but they can't complete their model, either because they don't have the skills or resources to get that model into a production environment. Out of all of the reasons that a project fails, I have experienced this one the most. So let's take a look into why this happens and how we might be able to prevent it. And I think it stems around the fact that we expect a lot out of our data scientists. We want them to know math and statistics in order to understand the theory of the models that they use. We also want them to have deep business expertise so they can make the best decisions for our company. And we want them to know programming and computer science so they can not only build these models, but get them into production. And not to mention all of the subfields where these intersect, like machine learning, data analysis, and software engineering. Clearly, this is an enormous undertaking for a single individual and it's been tough on a lot of data scientists, including myself. I mentioned earlier that I got my master's degree in statistics. And during my program, I learned a bunch about R. I can program just about anything I want in the R language. As I went into industry, I was exposed to multiple businesses and how, what matters to them and how to work things. So, of course, I felt pretty good about these things. But when I started to build my own models, I realized that I always needed software engineers to get these models into production for me. And without those resources, I know that my models would have failed with so many others like we saw before. And what's worse is that I'm in a minority where I actually have resources available to help me. There are many companies who either can't afford to hire or spare their engineering talent to work on data science projects. So what we need is a way to enable our data scientists to get their models into production on their own. One way we can do this is by reducing or removing that computer science and programming barrier and replacing it with something more accessible. Luckily for us, with our 2019.3 release of Tableau Prep Builder, We've added the functionality of including R and Python scripts directly into your workflow. For me, this means that I no longer need engineering support to get my models into production. So now I want to show you how you or your data scientists can do this too. So let's consider an example. Say you work for a large online video streaming service company. We'll call it Webflix. Your customer journey might look something like this. First, your customer makes a purchase. Sometimes this is an annual subscription. As they use the product throughout the year of their subscription, we're collecting data on that usage. This will include demographic information, who this person is, but it will also contain information on how they use the product. This could be how many videos they're watching, what types of different content they're viewing, and all sorts of other features we can come up with. At the end of their one year subscription, they have the decision to decide whether or not to renew that subscription for another year. As the data scientist, you've been asked to predict what these customers will choose to do. That is, we've just been asked to predict the future. So how do we do that? It turns out it's not too difficult to predict the future, and we just need three simple things. First, we need some data about the past. Then we need some data about the present. And finally, we need a predictive model. Super simple, right? 
The way these work together is we take our data from the past. These are users who have already renewed or not renewed their Webflix subscription. Using differences between these groups of users, we build a model identifying how, how they're different and finding patterns in the data. Once that's done, we can pass this model's algorithm onto the current set of customers who have not yet had to make that decision. Using that, we predict the outcome. That is, they will renew their Webflix subscription or they will not renew their Webflix subscription. So let's take a deeper look into each of these components. First, we'll look at data from the past. These are the users who have already done the thing we want to predict. So we have a customer ID represent, representing who we're talking about. We have the outcome that they took. Did they renew that subscription or did they not renew that subscription? The model is going to look for differences between these two groups of people. We then have the percentage of days that they were active, meaning how many days did they simply open the, the product to watch content, or maybe not. Then we have the number of watch hours they've watched during their subscription. I know for a lot of us, this would be really high, right? <laughs> yeah. We have the number of profiles they have on that account. This could represent how much they're sharing with their friends or their family. And finally, we have how many years they've been a customer with us. Here's a look at that one more time. Now we need some data about the present. Again, we have our customer ID representing who we're talking about. These are people who have not yet had to choose whether or not to renew their, their product. The percentage of days they logged into their subscription how many hours of content they've consumed, the number of profiles on their account, and how many years they've been a customer. You'll recognize that this looks really similar to the data that we just saw. We're just missing one key component, of course. Come on, there we go. That is, what are they going to do about it? This is what we're aiming to predict using our predictive model. Of course, I'm being a little facetious when I say that these are simple ingredients. Predictive models tend to be a bit complicated. So let's take a deeper look into what we can do for this model. And there are many different types of models that we can use for this type of binary classification problem. That is, we are trying to predict one of two outcomes. Will they renew the Webflix subscription? or will they not renew their Webflix subscription? Personally, I like to use Random Forest because it delivers a high degree of accuracy and it's actually pretty easy to explain to stakeholders. If you're not familiar, you can think of it as working similarly to your favorite online flowchart quiz, like this one. You start at the top and you answer the questions until you arrive at the response. In this case, we're attempting to determine if we are the American singer and actor Meatloaf. And I hope there are some people in this audience who know who Meatloaf is, so none of you are laughing, but here we go. <laughs> we can apply the same framework to our prediction problem for Webflix. It might look something like this, but the questions, of course, are tailored to what our customers do. So the customer, we again flow through this chart and a land at a single outcome. Will they renew or will they not renew? This is known as a classification tree. And while it on its own, it's technically a predictive model. That is, we can use this over here, this one chart to identify what every single user is going to do at the end of their term. However, you might guess that this model probably wouldn't perform very well. It's a bit oversimplistic. But at its core, Random Forest uses these classification trees to determine outcomes. It just does it in kind of a classification tree on steroids kind of way, where it builds thousands of models, or thousands of classification trees, that is. For each of these trees, it gives 
the outcome for every single record. So if we have an example customer flowing through all of these trees, we might see outcomes like these. What Random Forest then does is takes a majority vote. Which thing happens the most? In this case, renewing is the most common prediction for this person on these 15 trees. Therefore, Random Forest will determine that this outcome should be called a renewal. So now that we have all three of our components to build a predictive model for Webflix, let's look at how we can put all of these together in Tableau Prep. We start with our build data set. This is the data about the past. I'm calling it build data because it's being used to build the model. We also have our data on the present. Here I'm calling that score data since we're going to use it to score the, out, the current customers. To each of these, I'm going to add a step. If you're familiar with prep, it's as simple as pressing the plus button next to your object. You'll see here a sample of the data flowing through at the bottom. I want to create a calculated field representing what the purpose of each of these records are for. In this case, these records are used for model building. So that's what I'll call this feature. I want to do this exact same thing for our score data. So again, I'm going to press that plus button, add a step, and we'll again see some of that data flowing through. I'm going to create that same calculated field called purpose, but the purpose of these users is to score. We want to score an outcome for all of these people. And you can see the new field showing up at the bottom left. What I now want to do is union these two so I have a single data set to send over to our script. It's as simple as dragging and dropping onto the pane. You'll see that new feature we just added called purpose. And you'll also see an auto-generated field called table names. This is what prep does automatically when you build a table, or do a union, excuse me. This is a little redundant for us, so I'm just going to remove that. Now we're ready to build our model or add our model file to this flow. So with 2019.3 and up, you'll see a new option under the plus menu called add script. In here, we have the option to use our server or TabPy server. So I want to connect to our server and I'm going to use my local host. Now I just need to add the model file that I want to use. And before I do that, I want to jump into the R code behind this to give you an idea of what we need to send to Tableau Prep. So if you're familiar with R, I think you'll be able to understand everything I'm showing here. If you're unfamiliar, I will be walking through each step so you can try to follow along or just kind of hang back and chill out for a minute. We need to send two scripts in our file for Tableau Prep. And this is the first of those two. First, we're creating a function. In this case, I'm calling it fit underscore predict. This is a function based off of that first data set, the final data set before this step in Tableau Prep. Next, I need to load in the library I want to use for this model. Again, I'm using the random forest model, so I need to make sure I'm loading in the library where that function lives. First, before we do this, this package needs to be installed on the server that you're using. Since I'm using localhost, it just means making sure it's installed on my machine. But if you're using a remote server, which might be common, you'll need to make sure it's installed there as well. Here I'm making a quick conversion. All of the data that Tableau Prep sends over to the R script, if it has characters in it, it's going to send that as strings. If you're familiar with R, though, you'll know that the Tableau Prep has this concept called factors, which is somewhat unique to R. And in order to use random forest, we need our dependent variable to be a factor with usually two levels. So here, I'm just making that quick conversion. Now we're ready for the fun part. We're building a model, people. 
Here I'm calling the model build underscore RF. And using the random forest function in the random forest package, I'm creating the model based on the outcome, which has two levels, renew or did not renew. And then all of the independent variables we saw in our data from earlier. In the data argument, I'm subsetting the full data set to just include those that we're using for model building. We're not going to use those who don't have an outcome yet to build a model, it just doesn't make sense. Once that's done, we can use the model to predict probabilities for all of the current customers who we want to predict an outcome for. You'll notice here that I'm calling that churn underscore probs. This is because the baseline level of the factor outcome in the script is did not renew. If you're familiar with building these kinds of models in R, you'll know that it sets the baseline by default as the one that comes alphabetically first. In this case, that is did not renew, comes before renewed. Here, I'm also subsetting the data, but to include only those whose purpose was for scoring. This creates an entire vector of probabilities of churn. So these numbers will be, be between zero and one. The next step, I want to create a binary outcome for these people. Churn probabilities don't often make a ton of sense to end users, so I'm going to do a quick conversion so that all of the probabilities will fall into one of two buckets. So if your predicted probability of churn is greater than 0.5, we're going to predict it as a non-renewal. If it's less than that, we'll predict it as a renewal. I chose these cut points arbitrarily for this example, but as the data scientist, you will probably work to select this cut point based off of trade-offs in your sensitivity and specificity. I'm not going to get into that today, but be aware that these are totally arbitrary. The next step is to specify our output data for Tableau Prep. Here, I'm subsetting the data set down to just those whose purpose was for scoring. I don't need to send back all that data we use for model building anymore because we're really focused on those who we're trying to predict the outcome for. In the select argument, I'm selecting the columns that I'm interested in and not sending any others. Finally, I just need to return that output data set. Here's a look at that entire function one more time. I'll leave it up for a few seconds because I see some phones popping up. And as I mentioned, this is the first of two functions that we need to send in our file for Tableau Prep. And it's going away, guys. The second function is this one. Or we're generating an output schema for Tableau Prep. I'm not going to walk through every step of this one because it's kind of just one step. We're creating a data frame containing all of the variable types that we're sending back. Here, I'm sending back decimals and strings, but you also have the option to send back integers, booleans, dates, and date times. Now that we have all of the code that we need from R, let's go back to the flow. So here I'm just going to add in that file that contains both of these functions I just showed you. And we have to include a function name. Here I'm going to call that fit underscore predict, just like the first function I created. When I tab over, Tableau Prep is going to send a sample of the data through the entire workflow, including the model. So once this data loads, we can scroll over and see those new fields that are being created in R, churn probability and predicted outcome. Now the only thing that's left for us to do is to add output. Again, we just press that plus button and scroll down to add output. The great thing about Tableau Prep is that we can save to a file or to a Tableau server data source. And as Francois and team mentioned earlier, we will be able to save to a, data, to a database early next year. For my data, Tableau data source, I'm going to save to our marketing analytics folder, which is where I work in, and give that new data source a name predicted renewals. Now, the moment of truth, we have to run this. 
So all of the data is going to come in from both of those tables since we only saw a sample earlier. The build data is going to get a new feature called purpose where that field is going to say model building for everything. The score data gets the same field, but the purpose is scoring. We then union those two data sets together into one file that we can send over through the R script. As it's flowing through there, we not only build the model, but we also score the upcoming renewals so that we can determine what their outcome will be. And then finally, all of this publishes to a Tableau data source for us or our stakeholders to pick up and use right away. And it's done, just like that. We built an entire model right now. Technically, this was pre-recorded, so we really didn't, but you get it. <laughs> Before we look at that output, I want to give you a few more details about the R and Python integration in Tableau Prep. First, you can use any library or model that are included in these, in these programs. You're not limited to what Tableau releases on any schedule. The only thing you need to ensure is that you install the package first into whatever server you're using. With Tableau Prep Conductor, it's easy to schedule these jobs to run on a particular cadence. I mentioned earlier that I needed engineering support to put my models into production. And oftentimes when they were doing this, they would have to create cron jobs for scheduling those workflows. Well now with Tableau Prep Conductor, we don't need command line to schedule our jobs and we all can do that ourselves. One thing I will mention is that you will need a remote server in order to run flows on a schedule since Tableau Server won't have access to your local host. So be aware of that. And of course, we'll always have the freshest output data for our stakeholders to use. This allows us to bring insights to them quickly and we can provide them dashboards like this. We can show our stakeholders at Webflix that almost half of our subscription renewals are at risk of not renewing. As an executive for Webflix, our fictional company, I would be shocked and want to know what we can do about this right now. Of course, we can provide some of that information. At the bottom left, we can see that Asia and rest of the world are predicted to not renew at a higher rate than their North American and European counterparts. This might suggest to a business user that we should reconsider how we're approaching these areas. Maybe do some case studies and figure out exactly how to get these renewal rates up. We can also show them why certain people were scored to be predicted renewing or not renewing. On the left, we can see that those predicted to renew have a higher percentage of login days, have more user profiles, and have been customers for longer than those predicted to not renew their subscription. This could help people like our sales team at Webflix reach out to customers and have a starting point for their conversation. They can see that a user might not be using their subscription as much, so it could encourage that behavior. As a data scientist, you might get asked for this kind of information that's super actionable and we can do something about right now. And it can be really tempting to send over something like this. We give them what we want, what they want. That is the customer ID, uh, what their predicted outcome is, maybe some churn probabilities and some additional features about what these people are like. We just ask that the sales team rank from highest to lowest churn probability and work in that order so that they can approach those who are most likely to not renew. However, you might guess that this sometimes leads to a little trouble. People will often focus on why people are predicted to renew or not renew and dig into those places where the model found these small nuances. They might look at customer 35 and customer 62. Customer 35 is predicted to not renew with a churn probability of 0.81. Oh, 0.85, excuse me. And customer 62 is predicted to renew with a churn probability of much less at 0.41. But the salesperson might look at this and say, 
there's not a whole lot of difference between these two. And in some cases, customer 35 looks like a better customer. They've been with us for longer. I don't understand. Why is this person being predicted to churn at such an alarming probability? Well, certainly I'm guilty of sending over stuff like this. And as data scientists, we need to make sure that we understand who is the end user of what we're sending, of our visits and what we're sending over to them. So instead of sending something like this, that is prone to distraction from the main point of trying to get these customers to renew, we can send over something more like this. Of course, we're not out to hide any model detail or obfuscate anything from people. We're just looking for the most effective way to convey model information to our stakeholders. So here, instead of showing churn probabilities and all of the other features associated with them, we can send how this customer performs, if they're over or under uh, performing based on their peers. So going back to customer 35 and customer 62, it's pretty clear that customer 35 is in fact doing worse than customer 62. They're underperforming in the percentage of days they're active on their subscription and the number of profiles they're using. So sales can use this information and go to these WebFlip customers and say, hey, I noticed that you're not logging in as often. Why don't we try to get you the mobile app so you can take your content on the go? Or they could approach it from a profile's perspective and say, look, you might think you can't, but certainly you can share your subscription with your friends and family, thus deepening the relationship with Webflix. Before we go, I want to review some of those failures that we saw earlier and what we can do to prevent these from happening as well. We saw that sometimes our models should fail because they don't really make a lot of sense for our business. Data issues might prevent us from getting a model completed, and other times leadership might do that too. And of course, we talked a lot about the fact that sometimes we can't get our models into production. So how do we make sure our data science projects don't fail? First, we can, we can focus on the most impactful models. Data science is still a relatively new field, and people are still trying to figure out exactly how it fits into their company. While this happens, you'll probably get asked for some weird models. I guarantee it. But the important thing for us as data scientists is to make sure that our time is being spent on those projects that have the potential for the highest business value. These might not be the coolest or the most cutting edge models all the time, but it will ensure that we're working on things that will make a difference for the business and our customers. Next, we could work as a data community to solve data issues. Here at Tableau, we have a group of employees known as the data stewards. These are data power users, like data analysts, data scientists, and other data enthusiasts across the company. We work together to make sure we understand what certain KPIs mean, where to find data that we need, and what data is missing, and work together to find a way to get that data that we need. This will help us make sure that we're not always roadblocked by not having the data we need to build models. And of course, we'll have a hard time getting our models anywhere if our leadership doesn't think they should happen. This is one of the most important skills for a data science scientist to have is communication. And I'm sure a lot of us struggle with that. I know I do. But how I combat this is I work with my manager and my coworkers to find ways of explaining the models in new and different ways. I can then iterate on that process to find what works best for certain stakeholders or anyone. And I can better, I'm better able to explain my model at all levels of leadership. I hope all of you have peers or coworkers who you're comfortable having this type of open dialogue with. 
And of course, we just spent the last 40-ish minutes talking about how we can get our models successfully into production with the need for very little, if any, engineering support using Tableau Prep's new integration with R and Python scripts. Using all of these together, I think that most of our models will succeed, not fail like we saw earlier. So now, I want all of you data science wizards to get out there and work your magic. Real quick, before we go, uh, if you want to see more about how to use Python and R in Tableau Prep, I recommend going tomorrow to Hunter and Justin's discussion on optimal sales territory planning, where they will be reviewing this content as well. Oh, sorry. And then on Friday, Nathan Mannheimer will be showing even more data science applications in Tableau. He's a great person to learn from, and I recommend all of you go if you can. And of course, being Tableau, we love data. So please provide feedback on this session using the mobile app so we can better serve you next time. And thank you all for coming to my talk. We will open for Q&A. You will have to come up to this microphone to ask any questions. Thank you.